Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Rachel Elihus with the Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program. And this afternoon, I'm really excited to welcome an, an old friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Laura Cooper, who, and this is a mouthful, so, so bear with me, Laura is currently performing the duties of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. That is a big job. That includes everything from Europe to Russia through to Eurasia and the Balkans, as well as the Middle East and Africa. So we're really delighted that Laura could make the time to visit us today and talk with us a little bit about Secretary Austin's trip to the Black Sea region last week. Judging from the number of attendees, I'm guessing that there's a lot of interest in this topic, Laura, and needless to say, a visit to the Black Sea region was, was quite overdue. Um, I think Romania uh, and Georgia, the last SECDEF there was Secretary Hagel in 2014, and the last SECDEF visit to Ukraine was Secretary Mattis in 2017. Uh, so given the, the focus of this region and the busyness, uh, it, those visits were very welcome. It was really important as well, I believe, to recognize the contributions of those particular countries in Afghanistan, um, showing that, that part partners are as valuable as, as many of our allies. So the Black Sea is a tough region. You're going to talk us through it. You've got a lot of common and competing interests where Russia, Europe, the Balkans, the Caucasus, the Middle East all come together. And you have a mix of NATO allies, NATO partners, competitors, adversaries. So getting this right is, is really tricky. But I know and I have confidence that DOD and ISA in particular are thinking about this on a daily basis. And you're thinking about it comprehensively because of the way you're organized. So again, we're really excited you're here today, Laura, and I'm gonna turn it over to you for opening remarks. Um, to our audience, if you have a question, there's a form on the webpage where you registered for the event. You can just type that in there and, and then I'll ask those when we move to the Q&A session. But for now, over to you, Laura, and thanks again for making the time. Thank you so much, Rachel, and it is terrific to be here. And I have to say, even you know, a couple of years ago, if we had had this same forum, I'm not sure there would have been as much interest. So it's very gratifying for me working on these issues to, to see the attention that they're getting, the rightful attention, um, and uh, the degree of interest from the community. So what I thought I would do today is really use the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin's trip to the region as a point of departure for a larger discussion. And I thought I'd give you at the outset really kind of a, a, a back brief, an insider back brief on uh, what the goals were, what the discussions were about, and then we can open it up and, and, and expand into any number of uh, important policy issues. So, you know, to start with, um, I would say that this, you know, this trip, you mentioned the historic nature of it given um, the lack of senior level uh, visits uh, since 2014 in one case and 2017 in the case of Ukraine. Um, but it also was an important visit as we were coming out of COVID. Uh, so the secretary visited uh, you know, Romania, Georgia, and Ukraine, and he then went to the NATO defense ministerial, and it was the first in-person defense ministerial since COVID. So the overall trip really offered a wonderful opportunity to uh, pay attention to the Black Sea region, but also to recommit to our alliances and to our partnerships. So I would say if I, if I could um, encapsulate the themes of the, the Black Sea portion of the trip in particular, um, I would say you know, it's kind of three R's. The first R was reassurance. Uh, and here, um, obviously, you have countries that are very concerned about Russia's destabilizing efforts in the region. And we wanted to reassure these countries of the US commitment. And in the case of Ukraine and Georgia in particular, wanted to talk to them about how we do have this continued commitment to security assistance so that we are improving their resilience and their ability to defend themselves. Um, in the case of, of Romania, uh, this was an opportunity for us to celebrate uh, the one year anniversary of a 10 year roadmap. But again, the notion here is reassuring about the, the duration of US commitment. 
The second R is recognition, and you touched on this in your introduction. Um, the first piece of recognition was recognizing the sacrifices and the losses of our partners. First, in terms of Afghanistan, where you had uh, tremendous contributions uh, by Georgia and also by Romania, but also recognizing uh, the serious loss of life by Ukraine uh, in its war with Russia. Um, and then recognizing also though the accomplishments, the progress that we've seen uh, in both Ukraine and Georgia in terms of reform and um, the, the amazing contributions of Romania as, as truly a model ally in many respects. Uh, the third R, I already mentioned it, reform. Uh, reform was a huge theme, in, especially in the Georgia and in the Ukraine stops. Uh, with both of these countries, we have extremely robust advisory efforts, helping them work through their defense reforms so that they can create uh, institutions that are NATO interoperable and that are uh, transparent and uh, effective. So that was a huge theme in both of those stops. And then obviously you've already mentioned the cross-cutting theme. The cross-cutting theme was Black Sea uh, security. And in every stop along the way, we had great conversations about how to improve cooperation uh, related to Black Sea security. So I'll, I'll touch very briefly on uh, uh, the stops on a couple of you know, key highlights of conversation. Um, and, and then we can shift to the larger conversation. Um, uh, the secretary started in Georgia. Uh, in Tbilisi, um, and there obviously uh, stressed the theme of um, support for Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, in terms of this, you know, recognition and appreciation theme, um, you know, he did uh, uh, take the opportunity to thank Georgia for being uh, such an outsized contributor to Afghanistan. Georgia, as you may know, was the largest per capita troop contributor in Afghanistan, and Georgia actually suffered um, 32 killed in action and 293 wounded in action. Um, so, so we wanted to make sure to express um, our appreciation for, for these sacrifices. Um, in terms of the, the uh, security cooperation discussion, uh, we had the opportunity to formally advance uh, to the next phase of our, of our security cooperation effort and actually had a, a signing of a memorandum of understanding between Secretary Austin and Minister of Defense Bertoladza. And they kicked off what we're calling the Georgia Defense and Deterrence Enhancement Initiative. Uh, some of you may know by way of background, um, you know, several years ago, we launched what was the first US training program that aimed to build Georgia's capacity for a territorial defense. This was called the Georgia Defense Readiness Program. And that program was scheduled to sunset at the end of this year. So it was very important to us to chart a new course that would continue to support capacity building, but would really take Georgia to the next level. Uh, so this particular program includes uh, a strong commitment to institutional and organizational change management reforms, uh, as well as um, robust uh, training and advisory efforts uh, aimed at building the proficiency of Georgia's maneuver brigades. Maneuver brigades, And of course, in the uh, GDRP program, Georgia Defense Readiness Program, uh, we were also working on institutional reforms. We were also working on training, but at a lower level, at the battalion level um, and, and beginning institutional reforms, whereas now we're, um, we're at, a, at a higher level. Uh, the secretary also had a great opportunity to visit with U.S. Special Forces, Special Operations Forces, uh, who were in Georgia um, on a training mission, training uh, training uh, Georgian personnel uh, from multiple uh, Georgian agencies, uh, and this really highlighted our our role in building their territorial uh, defense uh, capacity. I think that, that that's probably a, a good summary on Georgia. So, so shifting, uh, shifting gears from Georgia, uh, uh, the secretary flew to Ukraine, to Kyiv. Um, and, and here it was a unique opportunity to build on what had just happened in August. Uh, as you may recall, President Zelensky uh, and in, in his Minister of Defense, uh, Minister of Defense Tehran, visited Washington at the end of August. President Zelensky was received by President Biden and President Zelensky actually had the opportunity to come to the Pentagon and, and meet with Secretary Austin. So in a relatively short amount of time, this was actually Secretary Austin's second meeting with both leaders. Uh, and they had just in, in August, uh, they 
they had signed the US-Ukraine Strategic Defense Framework. And again, this is charting the course of our security cooperation efforts um, uh, for, the, for the future. And the meeting that the secretary had in Kyiv gave him a chance to start talking about some of the implementation details. And it gave Minister of Defense Tehran a chance to start to um, update the secretary on how he is moving out on, on implementation. Um, you know, just by way of context, uh, the U.S. so far since uh, 2014, um, we have uh, committed more than $2.5 billion in assistance to Ukraine, uh, security assistance, um, including more than $400 million this year. Uh, and um, this also, uh, we also had a recent package of um, what's called presidential drawdown, $60 million that uh, was authorized and was rolled out in the context of President Zelensky's visit to Washington. So definitely a strong focus by the U.S. in you know, continuing to provide the security assistance that Ukraine needs uh, to defend itself. And certainly in terms of you know, the, the, the broader message, it was a very strong message of, um, of support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, also this thread of Black Sea security cooperation um, at this stop as well a chance to talk about regional cooperation. Um, and then I, I mentioned this at the outset, uh, de defense reform. This was another theme uh, touching on uh, status of reforms, um, status of US assistance uh, to be able to support those reforms um, and, and looking forward to uh, additional efforts uh, in the coming years on that. The last uh, regional stop before heading to Brussels was Bucharest um, and uh, Secretary Austin um, had the chance to meet with uh, both uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, Chuka, as well as uh, President uh, Johannes. Uh, and, you know, in those meetings, uh, I said at the outset that we wanted to recognize uh, achievements, and really it was a tremendous opportunity to recognize all that Romania has accomplished as an ally. Um, in many ways, Romania is doing all the right things. Um, they're investing in their own defense, uh, meeting certainly the 2% target, but also the 20% target. Um, they're participating in international operations and they have been, um, you know, from the early days uh, contributing uh, in Afghanistan um, since the very early days of the operation and also, also suffering um, serious losses, uh, 27 killed in action and 200 wounded uh, from Romania. So it was important to, to express um, appreciation uh, for, for what they're doing. Um, and, and, and again, to chart the course forward, um, it's only been uh, one year since, since the 10-year um, roadmap, uh, so we're only, only in, going into year two, uh, but it was important for Secretary Austin to be able to reaffirm uh, that we are on this path together um, and, and also celebrate it's the, it was actually the 10th anniversary of the U.S.-Romania Strategic Partnership Joint Declaration um, and the signing of the Bilateral Ballistic Missile Defense Agreement with Romania. Um, so a bit of looking, looking back, but a lot of uh, looking forward towards, uh, towards cooperation. And he, he culminated his visit at MK Air Base, where he had a chance to um, spotlight the uh, approximately 1,000 rotational U.S. forces um, uh, that are in Romania and serving as this very tangible uh, sign of, of our presence and our, our, our reassurance. Um, so across all of these all of these visits, you did have this thread of Black Sea security, this thread of um, of uh, appreciation and reassurance, um, and obviously this thread of concern about Russia's destabilizing actions in the region. Um, I'll just uh, conclude by noting that you know then the secretary was able to to fly to Brussels and you know cap his his trip um, with this broader focus on U.S. commitment to Europe, uh, U.S. commitment to uh, Article 5, and have some really productive in-depth consultations on issues ranging from defense and deterrence to Afghanistan to, uh, you know, defeat ISIS campaign uh, with his, his allies, uh, with, with his counterpart allies. So hopefully that gives you enough grist to chew on for the, for the discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Laura. No, that, that is an excellent rundown, both of the overall objectives that tie the different stops together, but some of the granularity at each of the stops. Um, and that's where I'd like to sort of start with a question, because listening to you, it sounds very much like the US 
and DOD in particular is working at two levels that on the one hand, you, you do a lot of security assistance um, and a lot of uh, capacity building among the forces in the individual countries. But then there's also this, this more top level integration when it comes to Black Sea security done through the NATO ministerials and whatnot. Um, I really like this idea of roadmaps and I know that they exist with other countries. Um, maybe just to focus in on those roadmaps for a while, because you pointed out that, that at least the ones with Romania and I believe Georgia are like 10 year plans. But in these initial years, do you have certain top objectives um, that you want to accomplish, whether it's in terms of security assistance or force training or, or something else? How over the next sort of two to three years or even a five year time frame, uh, would you know that, that we're on the right path in these relationships? Sorry, a little sticky on the <laughs> sticky on the button there. Um, so we think there there are commonalities across the three, and I'll try to sort of extrapolate what those look like. Um, we have immediate targets um, with all three countries when it comes to uh, defense modernization, and sometimes those are the most tangible things to focus on, um, and they and they certainly are uh, uh, extremely important in terms of the capabilities. Uh, that these countries have. Um, so in, in, in all cases, we are looking specifically at, you know, what are the requirements of these countries, uh, requirements to deal with the threat environment that they are in, uh, which again, the threat of, of Russia certainly looms large. Um, and so, so what, what capabilities do they need? And then there's a, a piece that relates to specific uh, interoperability goals. Um, and you know, certainly with a NATO ally like Romania, we are building off of a very high level of interoperability and, you know, a very high level of proficiency between our forces. And we're actually present in Romania. So we're able to, to work on this day in and day out in a very organic way. Um, but if you look at uh, Ukraine and Georgia, this focus on interoperability um, really is about uh, helping improve both of their militaries to operate according to NATO standards. Um, and those are NATO standards at the tactical level, at the operational level, uh, but also at the strategic level. And that kind of brings me to the next basket of um, kind of goals, uh, near-term near -term goals. And, and those relate to, um, you know, again, specifically for Ukraine and Georgia here to specific reforms uh, that we are looking at, um, at, at helping them with, whether it's a reform of, you know, procurement processes, which enhances transparency, or it's enhancing uh, civilian control of the military. Um, these are, these are uh, areas that we work on and we kind of break these high level goals down into uh, interim uh, milestones and targets uh, so that we can assess progress uh, uh, towards these uh, much larger uh, institutional changes. I hope that helps. No, oh, that's very helpful. Those, those buckets of defense modernization, interoperability, and then these ins more specific institutional reforms or, or broad reforms is, is really a good, a good roadmap, as you said. Um, well, this is a lot for the U.S. to do. I know that, you know, just watching what, what we're already doing um, in, in sort of Northeastern Europe and, and now what we're focused on in the Black Sea, much less outside of Europe, this is a lot for the U.S. And I know that DOD in particular is involved in a number of sort of strategic reviews like the Global Posture Review, the National Defense Strategy. Um, you know, there was a hearing on the Hill on Black Sea yesterday. A lot of the those who gave testimony called for, um, you know, an upgrade of the tailored forward presence that we have in Romania or the rotational force presence that we have in the region um, to an almost permanent presence. I think one used uh, used that terminology. How how um, I guess my question is twofold. How will these forthcoming reviews affect the Black Sea region? And more specifically, do you expect any changes in, in US posture uh, as a result of these? Thanks. Um, no, I think these are really uh, good and timely questions because we are in the midst of the, the National Defense Strategy, the Global Posture Review, uh, the Nuclear Posture Review, the Ballistic Missile Defense Review, all of these reviews um, that, you know, that have relevance to, to this region of, of the world. Um, 
I'll start, I, I, I first want to, to start um, by kind of zooming out a little bit um, because I think that one of, the, one of the really important concepts that I think you'll see us um, sharpen and, and unveil as part of our national defense strategy is this concept of integrated deterrence that you, that you may have heard us talking about. Um, and I think this is a really important concept uh, for the Black Sea region, in fact, um, but it applies, it applies across other challenges. And it gives you a sense of how we're kind of thinking of the issue space. So when we talk about integrated deterrence, we're talking about working across domains um, you know, so we would be looking, uh, you know, at something like cyber, not just at the maritime domain, for instance, um, in the Black Sea region. We're looking across regions and, and how those regions interplay um, across the conflict spectrum. Uh, here, I would just note, you know, Russia has a very flexible view of that con conflict spectrum, and I think it's helpful for us to be able to think across it. Um, and then also working across institutions. We're not just looking inside DOD, uh, we're looking across the whole of government, we're looking across the US government, and we're looking with allies and partners. Um, and I think that, that conceptual framework is gonna be very useful for us um, as we kind of operationalize our, our Black Sea strategy. Uh, in terms of the specific um, kind of threat assessment or security environment assessment, I think you will see coming out of our reviews um, an assessment that, that relates to the challenge of Russia as a destabilizing power. And, and obviously this is a challenge that's highly relevant for the Black Sea region. Um, but you'll also see uh, recognition of some of these functional challenges uh, that I think are particularly, you know, vexing in, in this region. Cyber is, is certainly uh, one of them. Um, I think that the other piece that I want to note, in addition to the fact that, you know, we are really proud actually of our increased presence in the Black Sea. Um, you know, I mentioned Romania, but it's also worth noting um, just in terms of our, um, our, our, our uh, actual maritime posture in the region, we have a, a fairly steady uh, presence in terms of number of ship days every year. Um, but beyond that, we have to look at our allies because it's not just about the US. Uh, and we're also uh, you know, very positive about the fact that it's not just the US that's been having this you know, steady presence in the Black Sea um, you know, through, through our, you know, ship visits, our port visits, et cetera. It's also our allies uh, and we're, we're operating together uh, and we're coordinating together. So I think, I think you will see a continued focus on that um, and, uh, and it will be nested under this larger, larger uh, strategic concept. That's extremely helpful. And I, and I must give you credit because I think that's the most coherent explanation I've heard of coherent in integrated, uh, integrated deterrence, uh, having read you know, all Secretary Austin's speeches and, and listened to a lot of pundits, that was really helpful in breaking down um, what exactly it is and how it relates to our allies and partners. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I think that's really interesting that integrated deterrence will, will you know, pull in not just these military tools, um, but, but also things that are more in the cyber and information domain. Another thing that sort of emerged um, in, in, in yesterday's hearing was this idea of resilience. Um, and the idea that you know, building a Black Sea strategy that is effective is not just about sort of the military security assistance, um, sorry, there go my lights because I haven't moved enough. Uh, the military security assistance, um, but it's also about sort of economic, political, and, and diplomatic actions. How closely are you working with colleagues at State Department and elsewhere in the interagency, USAID and whatnot, to sort of build and look at the Black Sea through that broader lens of resilience? Well, I think you know we are pretty much lashed up, uh, joined at the hip on on most of these Black Sea issues. Uh, I tend to look at it through the security lens first, and then the broader uh, resilience and economic piece uh, second. Thank you. I, I would say that. Oh, there you go. Now your lights back on. <laughs> um, but but I would say that uh, the area where there is probably the most sort of uh, bleed over, if you will, is really in this question of cyber resilience. Um, and that is a, a big focus area for, for all of us. Um, it is something that affects you know, civilian critical infrastructure. 
in all of these countries, well, in our country, in fact, um, it, it is something that requires the coordination of civilian and military elements um, and you know, national security coordinating elements. Um, so it's something that in Washington we're working together on, but also we're supporting um, our, our embassies in the field and our you know, partner and ally countries to be able to tackle with that very broad um, whole of government focus on resilience. Yes, that's that's really important. I, a lot of our allies do that very well, and they're they're organized in this way to be able to take advantage of, of whole of government. So it's it's great to talk with them as as we build integrated deterrence. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions from the audience about sort of specific uh, specifics with with the various countries. Um, so maybe I'll just dive into a few of those before popping out again. Um, one is about Ukraine um, and, and how it is constrained in its ability to assert sovereignty over its own territorial waters in the Black Sea and, and the Sea of, of, of Azov um, because of the constraints placed by Russia. In the assistance that and, and the cooperation with Ukraine, is there anything that the US and allies have done to sort of help build Ukraine's maritime capacity? Yes, there's, this has actually been a huge growth area, um, especially since 2018, uh, when Russia uh, uh, ha uh, had that attack on uh, the Ukrainian vessels uh, in the Sea of Azov. Um, and you know, since Russia has been you know, closing uh, commercial traffic in the Sea of Azov and uh, across the Black Sea. So, so since that point in time, you've seen not just the United States, but also allies increasing their focus. Uh, for the US specifically, uh, we have uh, started our assistance, um, not just with Ukraine actually, but with all of the uh, Black Sea countries that the secretary visited, plus with Bulgaria on maritime domain awareness capabilities. They have to be able to see the threat environment uh, to be able to address it. So we have been supporting Ukraine in developing those, those capabilities, but again, also Romania, Bulgaria, uh, and Georgia. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, with, with Ukraine specifically, I'll talk to, um, you know, we have been helping to build out their, their actual, uh, you know, naval capabilities. And here, um, we, so far, the U.S. has committed uh, uh, seven island-class patrol boats. Um, so these will, will be armed, as well as nine Mark VI armed patrol boats. Um, you know, they're they're being delivered over, over a time frame, but, but these are all uh, US commitments of specific capability. At the same time, we were really pleased, uh, this is going back maybe a year or two now, um, that the UK volunteered to take on board uh, a leadership role in maritime training. So you, you now have the UK um, along with um, uh, Denmark, um, I think it's, let's see here, Denmark, Canada, and Sweden uh, are all playing a role in maritime training uh, for Ukraine. So as I said earlier, it's not always just about the US. Uh, we have some very capable and willing allies and partners who are helping uh, as well. And then the other dimension to the, to the kind of capacity building and um, you know, uh, uh, training is the exercise uh, dimension. And we have a really robust exercise program that involves Ukraine, but it also involves other countries of the Black Sea with our annual uh, sea breeze exercise in particular. Um, so this is kind of just a snapshot of some of the things that we're working on. That's, that's very granular and very helpful. Thank you. I mean, it's wonderful to see some of what you've already seen going on in Northern Europe being replicated among allies and partners in the Black Sea region, because that, real, that model really has reinforced security among countries who are, have different membership patterns in different organizations and, and different concerns. Um, so I am getting a lot of questions with regard to the role of Turkey in the Black Sea. Um, and so I feel like I have to, to address some of these. Um, you know, I remember from, from you know, our work in the Pentagon that there were constraints uh, through the Montreux Convention. Um, is the, has that been an obstacle to improving security in the Black Sea? Um, and if so, are, are there certain things we can repair in U.S.-Turkey relations to help make sure that, that Turkey, uh, which has been an amazing partner in Afghanistan and elsewhere, is being an equally good partner um, in the Black Sea? Okay. 
sorry, I keep muting and unmuting. Um, so, you know, we really do see uh, Turkey as a, a valuable ally and partner, uh, including in the Black Sea. Um, and, and we have not seen the Montreux Convention uh, to be an impediment to NATO's presence in the Black Sea, to US presence in the Black Sea, um, to our ability to do these exercises that I talked about. Um, and actually we've seen Turkey maybe I would say increase its, its participation in some of these cooperative efforts. So um, for instance, uh, Turkey participated in a recent maritime exercise. Um, Turkey also, uh, you know, for the first time recently contributed to a bomber task force uh, mission over the Black Sea. Um, so, so we're seeing Turkey, um, you know, participating, uh, coordinating, um, and, you know, sharing a lot of our same security interests uh, in the Black Sea. Maybe, maybe just a follow on question on, on that one. Um, are you familiar with the Istanbul Canal project at all? Marginally? So I, have, I have only heard tangential mention of this, but it, um, you know, we, our assessment at this point in time is that we're not seeing any change in Turkey's, um, uh, likely support for Montreux, um, and so we're not we're not seeing this as as a as a challenge issue right now. Okay, I think that's that's an important benchmark. Is you know to the, the extent we're being a responsible ally if we're in an alliance. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, so on my sort of tour to countries that have been visited, uh, I haven't really hit on on Georgia, and you talked a little bit about um, the signing of the or the extension of the of the US training agreement with Georgian forces and, and how it's now at this higher level, um, but still focuses on these on these same pillars. Um, are there specific training needs that would be targeted under this this new agreement? Yes. So um, you know, again, first I have to start with the institutional piece because it's so critical. Um, you know, for the long-term uh, efficacy and NATO interoperability of, of the, um, the Georgian Defense Forces. And, uh, you know, there we, we do have specific, um, specific areas that we're going to be supporting the Georgians in um, transforming, really, their, their Ministry of Defense um, to enable uh, a NATO uh, model ministry with effective civilian oversight. So in the realm of institutional, we do have several areas that we're targeting. In the realm of um, operational uh, level training, here, um, I mentioned earlier, we're going really from kind of a battalion level focus to a brigade level focus, and um, it will help enable the Georgians to integrate fires and um, engineering into their operations. So it's a more advanced level of training. Um, but more broadly, I think one of the important points, and this goes back to your point about resilience, um, this isn't just about the Georgian Defense Forces. This is about the Georgian whole of government. And so we will be supporting Georgia to have effective you know, whole of government coordination uh, that will improve their resilience um, and improve their ability uh, to defend themselves holistically. I sense whole of government's becoming an important theme here linked to the resilience and, and, and that's really worthwhile. Um, we have a question here. Um, you know, you, you sort of mentioned the assistance to Ukraine from Denmark, Canada, Sweden, and the UK. Um, are you sort of happy, you know, a lot of these initiatives in the region, whether it's in Ukraine or, or it's Georgia or, or even to some extent in the Black Sea itself, tend to be coalitions of the willing rather than NATO efforts, right? They're like-minded allies who want to do something to reinforce the security of Georgia and Ukraine. Do you think an effort like the Maritime, um, one you mentioned in assisting Ukraine, could become a NATO-wide program if it had more resources? Or is it is it best sort of left right now as, as this coalition of the willing? To be honest, I haven't really thought about kind of what that would look like if it were under a NATO umbrella. So maybe that is telling in and of itself that I haven't kind of felt that desire to, to look at an alternative formula. Um, what we have found, not just in the maritime dimension, which, which really kind of just was created overnight um, under British leadership, uh, but also in the land domain, 
uh, is that um, you know we've had some really dedicated and, and very supportive allies, uh, and we've been able to develop some really strong coordinating structures with the Ukrainians in the land domain. It's the we call it the multinational joint commission, um, and the the key contributors for um, U- Ukraine's uh, army training programs are the UK, Canada, Poland, and Lithuania, and obviously the United States. Um, And so, you know, we feel like that has been a a very strong construct, but it's also expandable. We can always take on more. We can, and there are, there are plenty of other countries that are contributing, um, but aren't there on a daily basis and aren't, you know, continually training. So I think it's something we could explore, but, um, you know, but we haven't yet. And in Georgia, there has been a bit of a different model because you have had the substantial NATO Georgia package or SMGP that, that NATO has provided. And you know, in, in Georgia, what we found is that has been complementary to US bilateral efforts because you've had allies under uh, SMGP you know, contributing to specific, um, specific lines of effort that aren't already being covered uh, through a separate US bilateral effort. So I think either model actually can work. Yeah, either model or all models, right? As long as they're coherent and sort of talking to one another. So, so maybe picking up on that thread of, of NATO, because there is quite a lot um, going on in NATO. Um, you know, you mentioned Romania ally and, and Georgia and Ukraine being enhanced opportunity partners um, alongside Sweden and Finland. So, so this is a pretty high level of partnership with NATO. How have you seen the evolution of NATO's relationship with these countries? Um, you know, for example, NATO just released this new, well, they didn't release it, it's still confidential, but just announced this new concept for deterrence and defense in, in the Euro-Atlantic area. Will there be any impact of that on, on partners like Georgia and Ukraine? So I think with the um, with the concept of deterrence and, and defense in the Euro Atlantic area, this is really um, a broad framework for NATO, and it it speaks specifically to you know the threat environment. Um, certainly, certainly Russia is one aspect, but also you know terrorism is another uh, another aspect of of the threat environment. Um, so in the sense that uh, this concept is you know capturing. Uh, the key drivers of uh, instability and the key threat drivers uh, in in the region, um, it, it certainly is relevant. Um, but it, it, that that particular vehicle is not the vehicle to to chart the course for partner relationships. All right. Um, okay, I will back away from NATO. Now I'm getting a lot of capability questions. I don't think the participants can see one another's uh, another's questions, but they tend to come in in waves. Um, so, you know, Romania has certainly been the model of, of sort of procuring the types of, of equipment that get at sort of the specific challenges of the Black Sea region, in particular, the, the anti-access aerial denial. So, you know, purchasing the HIMARS and, and Patriots and whatnot are, are certainly positive. Are there other things we should be doing to arm our, our Black Sea allies and partners to offset um, those HUAD problems? Are there specific capabilities that you would like to see uh, materialize as part of this security assistance and defense modernization effort? This is something that we're constantly looking at and, and there's never a, a complete answer because we're, we're constantly building out the next year's program and the next year's program. Um, so I would say that, you know, especially when it comes to Ukraine and Georgia, it, it's an active conversation about what their, what their requirements are today and will be in the future uh, to defend themselves. And as I, as I suggested earlier, you know, this isn't just a maritime domain conversation. It isn't just a land or air conversation. It's really looking at the whole threat environment. Um, you know, some of the things that we look at specifically are, you know, what what is the requirement from uh, from a defense perspective? Um, you know, how will it be sustained? How can it be integrated with other capabilities that the country has? Um, and and the answers to those questions are are very uh, nation specific. Um, but I think it's it's really important. The broader point I think on the capability conversation, um, I get a lot of questions about what about this platform? What about that platform? What about this platform? And I think it's just really important to know 
that there's nothing that's off the table. You know, we we methodically look at all requirements in in close consultation with these countries, and um, you know, carefully consider um, each issue. It's not as though there's a, you know a set of things that is you know off the table completely. And I think that's important, um, and and oftentimes gets overlooked. Well, how how does that conversation happen then? So nothing's off the table, but clearly. Um, you know, there are, are political or legal limitations. Um, you know, how, how are these category, different categories of, of weapons considered? I have a very specific question here from one of our former colleagues about, you know, sort of the categories of lethal weapons. How are they considered for Ukraine in the wake of, of the Russian buildup? Um, you know, is, is that deterrence credible and, and how do we do our utmost to make it credible while still recognizing the sensitivity of this region? Absolutely. So, I mean, it, it really does start with that uh, bottom line on the ground assessment of what, what is the capability need. Um, from a process standpoint, if it's Ukraine that we're talking about, we have that multinational joint commission. So it's a very useful construct because Ukraine comes into this uh, discussion with their perspective on their requirements. And we have not just the US, but we have our allies there. So certainly the US um, you know, has a considerable security assistance budget for Ukraine, but there are some, there are some capabilities that other countries are, you know, are happy to support. So we have that, that broader conversation where um, we refine, we help Ukraine refine their requirement. In the case of some of these anti-access capabilities, you actually have to do specific you know, site surveys to, to, to ensure that you're, you're looking at the, the, right, the right capability and ultimately the right system. Um, and, but then you know, we, we, we bring it into our, our regular, uh, regular processes to examine you know, security assistance priorities. Um, you know, that involves a funding dimension, of course, um, but it's, it's our, our standard uh, processes from there. Yeah, well, it's good to hear. I mean, it sounds like a conversation that, that is happening bilaterally at that joint military level, but then also takes into account, you know, what's going on in, in the entire region. Um, you know, you've talked about a lot about, again, the role of allies and them stepping in to sort of help the U.S. with, with these issues. Are there specific things you would like to see from, you know, the Germans, the, the Brits, even the French? I mean, I guess the French are the ones I, I haven't heard mentioned in this list. Um, it does sound like it's mostly our Northern European allies um, who are active in this region. Are there certain things that, you know, are, are a comparative advantage that those countries have that you'd like to see them bring to the table in the coming years? Well, the first thing I would mention is that I would like to see all allies lift their restrictions on defensive lethal assistance. Mm. Um, at this point, you know, the U.S. has provided uh, Javelin, um, and both Ukraine and Georgia have also purchased uh, Javelin. Um, but that's an example of a defensive lethal capability uh, that we have provided. Um, and you still have a number of, of allies um, who have that as a restriction. Some have it as a restriction in terms of their security assistance programs, but some also have it as a restriction in terms of their sales. And I, I believe that Ukraine should be able to um, you know, purchase the, the, the capabilities it needs to defend itself. So I would like to see that restriction lifted. Um, in terms of uh, you know, specific assistance areas, I think the thing that's really important to note is there kind of is something for everyone. Um, there are so many needs uh, in Ukraine specifically, um, also in terms of you know, in institutional assistance needs. I mean, I'll give an example. We're helping with um, wounded warrior care and you know, with, with um, you know, setting up their, uh, essentially their uh, veterans affairs uh, equivalent. Um, this is a wonderful mission. This is a noble mission. And, and it's also the kind of mission that I can, I can imagine there are many countries um, that, that, would, you know, that would be proud to support Ukraine in, in that sort of a mission. So this isn't all about lethal assistance and it isn't all about you know, high-end capabilities. Um, it, it's about identifying what is that thing that an individual nation feels like you know, they can help with uh, that, you know, that, that, that sits well within their existing policies. Wonderful way to approach it. Um, I have another Turkey question, which is which is very you know current. Um, you know certainly 
there are difficulties in the US Turkey relationship right now and you've you've mentioned them as as you know being pretty cooperative in in the Black Sea but there's a pretty practical problem um, without getting too much in the details you know they because of the purchase of the S400 have been removed from the F35 program and are now trying to purchase F6 well they've had F16 since the 1980s but they're trying to upgrade those F16s and purchase more um so if they're not able to get approval for those upgrades or those new purchases, do you foresee this weakening um, security in NATO's south and eastern flank? And, and are there other options? How do, we, how do we get to a place where you know, we're having tough conversations with, with Turkey on the things we're unhappy about, like S-400, but we're not at the same time sort of undermining its ability to meet its commitments in NATO. Have, have you been thinking about that recently, given that request? So I think this is one of those questions where um, I don't want to get into specifics because it is an active conversation between the U.S. and Turkey. Um, we are very much um, looking for you know, positive path forward between the US and Turkey. We do value uh, Turkey as a NATO ally. And this exact issue that you have raised um, is something that we're in consultation with them on. So, so I'm sorry, but I don't wanna to kind of get into specific details on that out of respect for those, uh, those conversations. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit uh, to, you know, still defense and security, but not necessarily military per se. I'm gonna go into the gray zone as we call it. Um, and you already talked about cyber and the part and the importance of being linked up on cyber to build that resilience. But what about disinformation um, and misinformation? How much work is, is the Pentagon and OSD doing to help these countries with, um, you know, either spotting disinformation, uh, calling it out, having a coordinated mes message when it's seen. Is there anything in, in that area going on in your work with, with these Black Sea countries? Absolutely. Um, uh, the, the area of kind of the, the information environment and being resilient against Russian in particular, but frankly also Chinese, which we saw with COVID. With COVID, we saw both Russia and China having a tremendous wave of disinformation uh, that was hitting uh, our Black Sea countries, but also, you know, the rest of the world, really. Um, but we, we have this whole of government effort in which the Defense Department is in support of the State Department um, on, on helping countries with their resilience in this area. DOD certainly has, um, you know, kind of niche capabilities, and it's something that we are working with our military counterparts so that they're the you know defense institutions are also very focused on this issue set um, and find ways to make themselves more resilient. Um, but this is you know this is a big focus along with you know efforts that relate to kind of cyber capacity building, which I see as kind of in parallel but but mutually reinforcing, um, since a lot of these issues also uh, wind up with um, you know cyber uh, cyber related intrusion issues. That's good. Um, okay, now now the popular topic seems to be China. Lots of China questions. <laughs> I mentioned it. I mentioned the word China. So it was go. inevitable. It was inevitable. Um, so you know, our discussion has very much focused on Russian capabilities and influence and and behavior in the region. But what if anything are you seeing seeing from China in the Black Sea region, and and does that warrant a U.S. or NATO response at this point, in your view? So I think what we're seeing in the Black Sea from China is actually fairly similar to what we're seeing in other parts of Europe. Um, I would cite the Balkans as an example uh, of a region where we're seeing some of the same developments. And um, it's really uh, you know, issues of sort of uh, uh, investments uh, that, uh, that prove to have you know, a coercive element to them. Um, it's issues um, of you know, technology uh, that uh, you know proves to be uh, a bit of a trap if you're thinking about you know 5G uh, in particular, um, and it's um, you know use of uh, it's it's assistance again for um, for more coercive uh, purposes, and we saw this a little bit with uh, the so-called vaccine diplomacy as well. Um, uh, so it wasn't just a Russia story; it was also a China story. Um, but I think that you know. The good news for the Black Sea region is that, you know, this is a consistent topic that we talk about. Um, and there's a lot of awareness right now, I think, across these governments. 
um, there's a, a greater degree of vigilance, I think, um, against kind of predatory investment practices, um, against uh, you know issues related to, to, to 5G, for instance. Um, and, and even you know the cyber resilience that we talked about for Russia, there's also a big dimension of awareness of cyber resilience as a concern uh, for China. So you know from my vantage point, we're talking about the issues, we're talking about the concerns, and we're kind of working together on you know what are the best practices that we that we all need to address. And you know the, the U.S. Uh, you know doesn't have all the answers on on this. Um, we, we've had some, uh, you know, some real challenges uh, in terms of, um, you know, cyber and disinformation, uh, et cetera. So, so it's also about learning lessons from each other. Well, I actually think that's, that's a good note to end on because it points out one thread that you've, you've made clear since the beginning, which is, you know, although the U.S. has sort of started the, you know, the re-engagement with the region and Secretary Austin was there, this is a conversation that he continued in NATO, that we're continuing with U.K. counterparts, with Nordic counterparts, with Baltic and Polish counterparts, and others across, across the alliance and beyond, um, and, and really taking lessons from one another about how to deal with the very complex problem set in this region, whether it's conventional or cyber or in, as you just spoke, the disinformation space. So we're really grateful that you took the time and, and really thankful for your very honest and detailed answers to all of our questions. You know, uh, I, you did a great job. The Black Sea region is complex and it just shows um, that we have good hands in DOD taking care of this very good problem set. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for your time and thanks to all our guests for, for joining us. Um, that was extremely useful to me and, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. This was great fun. I appreciate it. Yeah.